Hi everyone, it's Tarrant. And Stella from the Dice Tower. Thanks for joining us. Today we'll be teaching you how to play Tanaris Adventures, a massive expansion for Arena the Contest. This game was designed by Alexandre Abud, Danilo de Alcantara, Michael Alves and Clayton Machado, and published by Dragori Games. Let's get to it. Set in the world of Dragori Games' previous release, Arena the Contest, Tanaris Adventures is a massive cooperative campaign. Teams of heroes will work together through a selection from over a hundred quests and stories, building their characters, fighting enemies, and healing the city structures, all trying to reach the best outcomes for their world. In this video, we'll take you through the rules to play a quest and to play the campaign. This requires components from the original Arena the Contest game box, and while most of the rules are similar to the original game, many have changed. As such, this will be a complete teach of the game with no prior knowledge assumed. We'll first take you through some of the initial setup, which sets the context for the campaign's tutorial quest. Then we'll take you through the onboard rules for completing a quest, and then we'll take you through the between quest rules for completing your campaign. To begin your campaign, you will have opened the city book and begun reading. And you'll get to the point of choosing your heroes. Heroes are characters who have a black background on their text box. The team must choose four heroes, irrespective of player count, and each hero must have a different role, indicated by this word here or the border colour of this box. The quest setup gives you some guidance on what represents a good balance. Take note of your hero's passive power for the quest. Ignore this bar at the bottom for now. Find all of your hero's matching starting cards. This is the two general attack cards which match your role and state level zero. It's the four attack cards which match your hero. And note, these are also considered level zero. They may come from a different Arena the Contest game if the character was pre-existing before Tanaris. And be aware that some pre-existing characters have one or more replacement attack cards indicated by this icon. And it includes the starter weapon and armour, allowable for your combat role. You'll have your role skill pad and you'll activate four out of the six level one skills on it of your choice. Eventually you'll get to the setup for the quest. You'll lay out the board. Around the outside is a track which is used for counting all health points and other elements of the game. Determine your starting health from your skill pad and your armour, and mark it with your roll marker. You can never heal above this starting health. The quest guide tells you all the components you'll need to gather for setup. This includes all of the villains. Find the matching numbered villain in the deck, and find its mini and a matching coloured base ring. The colour and shape of its ring indicates which health marker you'll use to track its health. There's only two rings of each colour, so wait until the mini's been placed on the board before you set it up. In some cases, inanimate objects may also have health trackers, in case the scenario involves smashing it apart. Set up the board using only the components which are printed with a white border. Coloured boarded pieces are placed only when the matching coloured event is triggered. Then read through the quest's information. The primary objective is your aim, this is what you'll need to do to win the quest. You'll lose if you don't meet this objective, if you meet a specific lose condition, or if any one of your heroes dies and can't be revived with first aid. More on this later, but take two first aid tokens for now. There may be an extra challenge, which gives you extra loot when you complete the quest. You'll also be taken to read this quest's chapter in the game's journal. Make sure you know what's going to trigger the next events in the quest, and you're ready to play. A quest in Tanaris Adventures is played in rounds, and in each round, each active combatant, that is, each hero and each villain, will take one turn. You'll use a fatigue cube to mark when a combatant has taken its turn. 
The heroes will normally act first. Each will take one turn in whatever order the players wish, and this can change from round to round. When a hero attacks a villain, that villain may be provoked to retaliate, and if that happens, then the villain jumps ahead of any other heroes to take the next turn. Once all heroes have finished taking their turns, then any unprovoked villains will take theirs. This again happens in the order of the player's choosing. Be wary of unprovoked villains. Their hits are all treated as if they were critical hits. And be aware that some effects will cause fatigue, effectively causing that combatant to miss a turn. Once everyone's fatigued, resolve all of the quest's active end of round effect, indicated by this red R, in the order they're printed. All of these are considered to be a single turn, for the purposes of any once per turn effects. Then remove all fatigue and proceed to the next round. Now we'll talk about how to resolve a hero turn. And do note, a lot of these rules do also apply to a villain turn, but we'll explain the differences for that later. A hero turn comprises a move action, which is mostly moving around the board, and a prime action, which is usually used to attack. You may take these actions in either order, and you may choose to pass on either of them. There are three different ways to spend your move action. You can move and interact, sidestep, or focus. Usually you'll move and interact. Gain movement points based on your skill pack. Each movement point allows you to move to an adjacent square, and adjacency is always counted both orthogonally and diagonally. Five movement points from here would give you the flexibility to move to any of these squares. You may move through an ally's square, but may not finish on it. You are fully blocked by barriers, which are walls, closed doors, and barricades, meaning you cannot move into them or diagonally through the corner of them. You are partially blocked by enemies and obstacles, meaning that you can't move into them, but you can move diagonally past them. And there are various terrain tiles which have different effects when you enter them, finish on them, or move through them. Moving diagonally across the corner of a terrain will trigger any immediate effect. A full list of terrains and effects can be found in Chapter 13 of the rulebook. If you state your intention to use a movement point to move as part of your move action while adjacent to an enemy, then this incites a reaction from the enemy. This trigger is very specific. If, for example, you were to be moved as part of an effect of a prime action, the reaction would not trigger. It is only making a move as part of the move action on your turn. Check the reaction statistic of the enemy whose reaction you incited, and suffer that amount of damage. Then continue with the action you declared. By definition, reactions are effects, not attacks, and if you have a card from an earlier Arena of the Contest game which refers to a reaction attack, simply treat it as a reaction effect. This is a change in rules from earlier games. A combatant incites only a single reaction per turn, and for the heroes, this will be the first reaction incited. This entire movement would only incite reaction from this enemy. You'll also use this action to interact with interactable objects. To do this, simply be adjacent to the object in question and spend one movement point. Most of these will be specific objects explained by the quest, but there are two generic ones which I'll explain now. First, you can interact with an unlocked door to open it, and if this happens, simply remove the token from the board. It cannot be closed again later. The second is a chest. A hero interacts with it to pick it up, and from that point it becomes common property among all heroes. At the end of any hero's turn, a chest may be opened and spent to heal any one hero by 30 hit points, and then any heroes whose healths are below 20 by 10 hit points. The second option for your move action is to sidestep. Simply move one space to an adjacent square without inciting any reactions. The third option is to focus, and this is particular to heroes with ranged attacks. 
When focusing, you forego your move action in order to have a better shot at your prime action. Think of it as carefully taking your time to aim before you shoot. We'll explain exactly how this works later, but it's only open to heroes with no enemies within range 3. On each turn, you may take one prime action. You can use this prime action to take a second move action. All the rules we just described before still apply. And you can combine the movement points together. For example, if you needed to, to enter a swamp, which requires two movement points per square. However, on most turns, you'll be using your prime action to attack an enemy. There are three types of attack. Basic on your skill pad, which you won't use very often. Primary, shown in silver, you'll be using these most of the time. And special in gold. These are much more powerful, but can each be used only once per quest. At its very simplest, an attack involves choosing one of your attacks, choosing a target enemy, rolling a die, and comparing with the enemy's defence to see whether you hit, and applying the hit effects of the attack you've chosen. If you miss, you'll still do some residual damage and gain some mana as a consolation. The full sequence of an attack is broken into three phases and ten steps. First is the declaration phase. Step one is to declare which attack you'll use. You have to choose one of your attacks which is currently face up, and then separate the card from the others. There are some effects during an attack which will cause attack cards to be flipped face down, but the card you've separated is not a valid target for these effects. As soon as you've done this, consider your prime action to be spent. If something else happens which prevents the attack from occurring, you do not get another prime action. Step 2 is benefit or drawback, and this applies only to attacks which have one of these two keywords. Benefits are optional, and drawbacks are mandatory. And sometimes they apply to later phases of the attack, in which case you'd resolve them then. But otherwise, this is the point that you resolve it. Here, for example, the benefit is to move to, ignoring terrains. Step three is to declare your target, or in some cases, targets. Your targets must be within the attack's range and have vision. There are three basic types of attack with different ranges. The sword is close quarters melee with a maximum range of one. The pike is extended reach melee with a maximum range of 2. And the bow is ranged attack with a maximum range of 8. Range is counted in the same way as movement. Each of these enemies is currently at range 6 from the hero. To have vision, it must be possible to draw a straight line from any point of the hero's square to any point on the villain's square without it crossing or touching a square containing a wall or door, even just grazing the corner. As you can see here, the green enemy is within the hero's vision. However, the red enemy is not. While in this case here, the red enemy is within vision, but the green enemy is not. Obstacles, combatants and barricades do not block vision. So red is still within vision in this layout, and blue has always been within vision. Some attacks have more advanced ranged and targeting rules, and their full details are found in rulebooks Appendix C. At this point, you must have identified a valid target for your attack in order for this action to be legal. In other words, you cannot use your prime action just to gain the benefit from an attack card without then resolving the attack. The exception is if there would have been a valid target, but some unforeseen effect triggered by the enemy means that there is no longer one. In this rare case, the combat and action end now. If your attack had more than one target, you must also declare the order in which you're going to strike these targets as part of this step. The earliest unfatigued enemy in that striking order is now provoked to retaliation, meaning it will take the next turn. So here, for example, if red were struck first, then after the bruiser's turn, it would be the red enemy before the next hero. 
If red were already fatigued, it would be green who would take the next turn. And if all targets of an attack were already fatigued, then no villains would be provoked. Finally, if the attack is ranged, that is, has the bow and arrow regardless of the actual distance, and there is an enemy adjacent to that hero, then this incites a reaction. As before, lose health equal to the enemy's reaction statistic. This occurs only at this specific time, that is, after declaring a valid target on a ranged attack, which is part of your prime action on your turn. You may still incite only one reaction per turn, whether it be from movement or attack. Next is the strike phase, and in an attack with multiple targets, you'll resolve this phase separately for each target. The first step of this phase, step four, is to roll the die to get the natural roll for this attack. In step five, you'll adjust your natural roll to determine your final roll. You'll then compare your final roll against the enemy's defense to determine whether you hit or miss. You can skip these modifications if you rolled a natural 1, this is always a miss, or if you rolled a natural 20, which is always a critical hit. For any other roll, increase or decrease the result based on any roll bonuses or penalties that you have across your cards, effects, weapons, conditions, and so on. Your aim is to get a final roll which is equal or higher than the enemy's defence. A defence value may also be adjusted in this step by various conditions and effects. There are two tactical situations to watch out for in particular. If your hero focused during its move action, and there is still no enemy within range 3, then the target is exposed, reducing its defence by 3. If the attacker has at least one ally who is adjacent to the target but not adjacent to the attacker, then the target is considered mobbed, and this also means it's exposed, reducing its defence by three. Here, the target would be mobbed by a green or yellow attack, but not by a red one, since both of the allies who are adjacent to the enemy are also adjacent to the attacker in red's case. Step six is to resolve the hit or miss effect of the strike. If this was the first hit of your turn and your passive power triggers on a hit, then you must resolve this effect first. Then apply your attack's damage value to its target, optionally plus 5 if this was the first critical hit of your turn. If you rolled a miss, then nothing happens for now. This is the end of the strike phase, and you'll go back and resolve this phase again if there's any other targets for the attack. You'll now go on to the execution phase, which you'll resolve once for the attack. The first step of this is step 7, additional effects. If at least one of your strikes hit, then your attack hit, and you get to resolve one or two effects. First, you can resolve the hit effects that are printed on your attack card. Secondly, you can resolve the hit effect, indicated by this icon, on your weapon, resolving its effect and then flipping the card face down. Any passive effect on the back of the card remains in effect. You may resolve the cards in either order, but within a card you must resolve it in order. If, on the other hand, all of your strikes missed, then the attack missed and you resolve the miss effect. This always involves gaining one of your coloured mana cubes to your pool, and generally involves applying residual damage, or R damage, to one of the targets. Residual damage works like normal damage, except that it can never reduce a health below 1, and any game effects that refer to damage do not apply to residual damage unless specifically stated. Step 8 is to resolve your attack card. Usually, if it was a primary attack card, flip it over and return it to your supply. If it was a special attack, then it is discarded from the game. The exception is if the attack has an ongoing effect on a target. In this case, you would place the card on that target, and place the card owner's small token near the mini as a reminder. 
Once any such effect ends, the card is returned to its owner and then flipped or discarded as it would otherwise have been. The process of expending all four of your primary attacks is called a cycle. When you begin your turn with all four either flipped over or away serving as effects, the cycle is over and you flip them all face up again and get to reactivate one of your items, flipping it face up as well. Step 9 is to resolve death effects. A combatant is dead as soon as its health reaches zero, but you only resolve the effect of that now. In all cases, this includes replacing the mini with the token to indicate where the death occurred. And there may be some other effects. We'll go more into deaths later in the video. Finally, in step 10, the attack is over, and any effects which trigger when the attack has resolved are resolved now. A couple of other types of attacks to be aware of. You can resolve a basic attack. This always has the benefit of a plus one roll modifier and always deals this damage shown on your board. It has no extra effects for either hit or miss in step seven and is an all round weak option to use. The main reason you'd use it is if you were triggering some sort of other effect which referred specifically to a basic attack. There are also some attacks which are not violent in nature, particularly healers attacks. They usually target allies and you resolve them the same way that you would an attack, with a roll and so on. We've already introduced the concept of an effect, and essentially an effect is any resolved piece of text on a card. Some effects will modify another effect which is already ongoing, others stand alone. Many effects allow you to choose a target, and the target does not necessarily have to be the same target as the attack which caused that effect. Unless otherwise stated, the target must be within range 8 and vision, the same as it would be for a ranged attack. There will often be restrictions stated. Here for example, the effect applies to enemies within range of 3, that's what's indicated by the square brackets. The good parts of effects are always optional, the bad parts are always mandatory. An effect may be instantaneous, which has no icon. It may be temporary, indicated by the hourglass, and in this case it lasts until the start of that combatant's next turn. It may be permanent, meaning it ends at the end of the card owner's next cycle. That means at the start of the turn where all the primary attacks are flipped face up. Here the effect comes from a special attack and so when it ends the card is removed from the game. There are also temporary and permanent effects which specify that they also end if used. Many effects apply a condition which can either be blue for positive or red for negative. Conditions may also be indicated by these green and orange tokens. Refer to Rulebook Chapter 4 for a list of all of the game's conditions and the impacts they have on your movements and attacks. Multiple copies of the same condition can stack. For example, if you were empowered twice, you would deal plus 6 attack damage. And each condition is gained or suffered only once, and only the first time that you consider it in your action. For example, Distracted would resolve the first time you made an attack roll, Empowered would resolve the first time you made a hit. Each hero has a skill pad, and at the start of the game you'll choose four of its 14 skills to bring into the quest. Initially, you'll be limited to level 1 skills. Skills are powered with mana, and there are three basic ways to gain mana. These are as a consolation prize when you miss an attack, as a bonus when any villain dies, and as a bonus when any boss's health drops below a multiple of 70 and one of these tokens is discarded. In each of these last two cases, the mana bonus is won by all heroes, not just those involved in the attack. Specific cards may also grant mana. You may hold at most 5 mana. There are two types of skills, those which you may use on an ally's turn and those which you may use on a villain's turn. These may not be used on your turn. 
to a maximum of once per turn per player, a player may pay the mana cost to resolve a skill. Then flip the skill token over to its charged side if not already. This increases the cost for that skill by one mana. Some of these resolve immediately, and some of them create effects or conditions which last only until the end of this turn, or until first used. The target of any skill must be within range 8 and in vision. Each player has a total charge effect, and once all four skill tokens have been charged, this effect resolves and the tokens flip back to the uncharged sides. There's also a mana power effect. You resolve this as a free action on your turn, and it's the only way to spend mana on your own turn. We'll now look at the villains and the villain turn. Each villain has its own card, showing its statistics, a colour and index number, its level, and the details of its attack. Some villains will have their own passive powers. A villain turn is broken into three parts. First, choose a target, then a move action if that move is necessary to attack the target, and then a prime action to attack that target. Villains can incite reactions from heroes on their turns in exactly the same way as the heroes incite reactions from villains. Like the heroes, this can only be once per turn per villain, however the heroes can choose to defer the first reaction if a later reaction is going to be stronger. First, determine the villain's target. Your first step of this is to determine which heroes are reachable by the villain, that is, able to be attacked using that villain's movement and attack range on this turn. A hero does not need to be within range or vision to be a reachable target. This villain has movement range of 5 and a melee range of 1. Taking into account that this is swamp and requires 2 movement points to move through, these are all of the spaces that the villain could move to, and therefore these are the only reachable targets. Among them, choose the hero that meets the villain's criteria. Red villains choose the one with the highest remaining hit points. Orange chooses the lowest hit points. Green chooses most mana, and blue chooses the greatest distance away. If there's a tie, choose the closest hero as the crow flies, and if still tied, it's the player's choice. Suppose here green is the target. The villain now moves the shortest path to get within attack range, and if tied, the safest path. If still tied, it's the player's choice. In this case, you'd need to take a path which bypassed these spikes, but you would have options to end up in either this or this square. The villain favours a short path over a safe one, so here it would move like so and suffer spike damage rather than taking the long way round. A villain won't move if it can already attack its target, unless it would benefit from a sidestep. If there are no reachable heroes, then the villain does a Dark Surge. It suffers 3 residual damage, its movement range is increased to 10 for this round, and it targets the closest reachable hero as the crow flies. Now the villain attacks, following the same attack sequence as a hero attack. There's a couple of key differences to note. Villains can never focus or mob. If a villain is unprovoked, that is, you haven't attacked it earlier in the round and it's acting at the end of the round, then any successful hit based on its final roll gains plus 5 damage. When you check your defence, it's based upon your skill pad. And you can choose to flip over an armour card to gain its additional effect. And when green or orange villains hit, the effects that they leave are tracked with these green or orange tokens. Some heroes have interrupt attacks, which can be declared at a specific time during a villain's turn. If this interrupts a villain attack, then you will pause the villain's attack sequence and resolve a complete attack sequence for your interrupt attack. Once your attack is fully resolved, you will return to the villain's attack at the point where it left off. If the villain's attack is no longer possible, then its action is over. 
Many quests include bosses. These don't have cards, you'll use the information printed in the quest book. They're bigger, stronger and more powerful, but they otherwise function in much the same way. Their hit points all exceed 70 points, which you'll track with these 70 plus tokens. And once a boss has dropped below a multiple of 70, this is discarded, granting all players a bonus mana, and setting a new limit at the next multiple of 70, above which the boss cannot heal. Bosses are immune to effects which would fatigue them out of turn, control them, or negate, copy, or remove their attacks. For any such effect, instead deal 12 damage. In many scenarios, a group of villains may begin guarded. While guarded, the entire group is inactive and does not take turns. The group becomes active as soon as one of its members is targeted for an attack or an effect by a hero. Or any hero enters a range of three. As soon as one's guarded status is lost, they all lose that status and all of them will activate in this round. Guards have the shielded six condition up to the end of the attack or effect which cause them to no longer be guards. A hero or villain dies when its hit points reaches zero. Effects associated with that death resolve immediately or in step nine if it occurred in combat. The mini is replaced by the token so you know where that combatant died. Combatants can freely move over or through this token. Active effects on that combatant end and while there are some effects and attacks for which that combatant can be targeted, heal is not one of them. When your hit points are zero, you cannot heal. A dead hero remains in its current position within its cycle, and can still gain mana from other effects in the game, although cannot spend them on skills. At the start of that hero's next turn, that hero must be revived. Spend one of the team's first aid tokens to revive that hero with 30 hit points and heal all other heroes 10 hit points. That hero then proceeds with a full turn as normal. But if the team is out of first aid tokens and the hero can't be revived, then the quest is over and the players lose. If you can meet the quest's primary objective without this happening and without meeting any other lose conditions, then you win the quest. Every quest must be played with four heroes. If you have fewer than four players and nobody wants the complexity of controlling two full heroes, you may instead use comrades for your excess heroes. These are a simplified version. They comprise a hero card with its passive ability, two generic comrade special attacks. These are greater impulse and lesser impulse and that Combat Rolls Comrade Primary Attack card, the level one version. Comrades gain mana like any other hero, and this can be spent to do this specific skill. Or any other hero may spend the Comrade's mana as if it were their own. If a Comrade ever gets an effect which would flip a Primary Attack card or a skill token, then ignore that effect and instead heal three. Welcome to the city of Warfugee, where your story takes place. The full campaign of choices, quests and consequences takes place over all of the game's books, cards, maps and logs. In particular, the campaign log tracks your game over six thematic weeks. Each week before the final one contains four journey phases, where you'll resolve adventure cards and quests, three city phases between quests where you'll level up your characters and the city, and one world phase where you'll work to capture the regions. The log also tracks your Kemet hunt level. The better you perform, the more the Kemet army which dominates the world is going to try to hunt you down. The more difficult the game will become, but the richer will be the rewards. Kemet hunt level begins at zero. I will now teach you the rules for managing the campaign, but be warned, these rules do not apply to the two quests which make up the tutorial campaign introduction. 
This campaign introduction, which you'll begin by reading from here, introduces all of the rules I'm about to explain, and does so gradually. It's not until you enter your third quest, which will be represented by day one on this log, that you'll start to apply these rules. So please keep that in mind when you're going through the tutorial. Follow its instructions precisely and don't apply any of the rules I'm about to tell you until it allows you to do so. So first, let's suppose we've run through day one's quest and are now at the end of that quest. When you finish a quest, the quest book will direct you to that quest's chapter in the latter half of the journal. It will tell you which numbered passages to read, and when you get to a section called Conclusion, this will be the end of the quest and all of its consequences. These will vary, but there are some standard benefits in all quests except for the tutorial. First, you'll draw random loot cards from the deck. If you win, you'll get three loot cards for completing the primary objective, a bonus two loot cards for completing the extra objective, one loot for each unspent first aid token, and loot cards equal to your Kemet Hunt level. So here it would be zero. If you lose a quest, the lose box will still describe a milestone within that quest. Gain two loot if you met that milestone, and again, gain loot equal to your Kemet Hunt level. If you win or if you lose but meet the milestone, then you'll get to take the quest card which corresponds to this quest. Reveal it and then, for now, read only the mastery points black bar in the centre of the card. This grants you two types of war points. Here it's politics and organisations in the strategist box. So you would find politics and organisations, fill in one of its circles, if possible, and then for each circle you fill in here, fill in one of the squares on the matching track. Each time you reach a starred square, open that faction section in the city book and read the corresponding paragraph. You'll keep the top half of the card to resolve in the next world phase and ignore the bottom half. This is used only if you're playing a standalone quest rather than a campaign. The journal may also advise you to gain a fact, in which case mark it in the campaign's fact log. Then mark your quest in the list of quests, and note the letter of the adventure card which led you to that quest in the adventure box. You may now change your Kemet Hunt level for the next journey phase. You may optionally increase the level by one if you won and completed the extra challenge, and use no first aid tokens or chests. You must reduce your level by one if you used any first aid tokens or lost the quest. You can also optionally reduce this level as far as you want. When it goes higher, it does make the scenarios harder but makes the rewards richer. According to the updated rules at the time of filming, maximum Kemet Hunt level is six. Eventually, you'll reach the words, this quest has ended. Once you've reached that point, you can pack up and end your gaming session if you wish, or move on to the next phase. After most quests comes the city phase, and this is a place for meeting characters, benefiting from structures, and gaining upgrades. The city phase is, at its core, a campaign-long deck building game. The deck you'll be building will be composed of character cards, and these can be the hero cards which we saw before with the black box, or non-player character cards which will have a white box. Any characters that your team currently owns and has access to will be in what's called your character deck. At the end of the campaign tutorial, your character deck will be 28 cards the 24 initial NPCs, and the four heroes that you used in the tutorial. All remaining character cards which you don't currently have are called the City Deck, and this will include a deck of all of the remaining heroes, and all of the NPCs which are labelled with the current campaign week. As you move from week to week, you'll change this part of the City Deck out with the next week. To set up, lay out the city board. 
shuffle and deal face up four random NPCs from the city deck. The rest can be put off to the side. At the bottom, lay out your current level for each of the four structures. This will be level one to begin the campaign. Shuffle and place the team's character deck, and then each player draws four character cards. As for the quests, this must be played four players, and if you have fewer than four, someone will have to double up. The hero cards could be distributed anywhere among the four players. Also take some cubes. It doesn't matter what colours, you're only using them as markers in this phase. After setup, the city phase is played in three steps. The playing phase, the spending phase, and wrapping up. On the playing phase, each player takes one turn in whichever order you wish. And a turn is spent playing any number of cards from hand in order to place as many cubes as possible on the board. Each card produces one or more of the game's four resources. Character cards generally have a lot more resources than the NPCs, while some NPCs also have options or special playable actions. In a single play, you need to spend enough resources in order to place the cubes shown on the space you're taking. So say, for example, I wanted to place two cubes on this expedition. I'd need six force and three diplomacy. I get four force and four diplomacy from my character, and three force from this NPC. It does overpay slightly, but I don't get change. What I do get is to place two cubes on this expedition. You can only play a card when it is your turn, unless it has a lightning bolt effect. This can be played out of turn to support another player. Suppose we wanted to place one cube here, but no single player had this combination of resources. The active player could play this card for three intelligence, and have an inactive player play this card for two diplomacy, in order to meet that requirement within a single play. Each expedition has two spaces for cubes, with their cost shown here. The cost to place a cube on an NPC is shown in its top right. And the cost to add cubes to structures is shown here. You can't place cubes on these later spaces until you've upgraded the structure to a certain level. Once each player has taken a turn in the playing phase, it's time for the spending phases, where you spend all of the cubes as a team in any order. At the expeditions, you draw one random loot card for each cube, plus an additional loot card for every three cubes. Any NPCs with cubes are gathered up and added to your character deck. Then at the structures, there's a variety of different effects you can do. The natural lab lets you change out loot cards for different types of loot cards that you want. At the tavern, you spend cubes and loot to draw new heroes and add one to your character deck. At the weapon shop, you can exchange items for other items. And at the outpost, you can trash low value cards from your character deck. As long as you don't go below a deck size of 24. You can spend cubes to gain a specific loot. Or you can open a number of item cards for later purchase. What you open depends on the building. Here, for example, this one does weapon level zero bows. And so when you open two of them, you find all of the level zero bows and open two of them face up like so. Finally, you can spend the cost shown here to upgrade a structure to its next level. This makes the building's abilities more powerful and it makes the attack cards for a certain class of hero more powerful. With a level 1 weapon shop, my brutes and shooters would need to go into a quest with four level 0 primary attacks. With weapon shop 2, now I have access to my five level 1 primary attacks, and I can go into a quest with up to two level 1s. The numbers here are all maximum. With this, I could go in with a level 3, a level 2, and two level 1s, but I could choose to keep some level 0s if I wished. Structures do not impact your special attacks. Once all the cubes have been spent, players can now spend loot to purchase items which were opened in the earlier phase. 
Once an item has been purchased, it becomes common property and can be equipped to any hero who can legally hold it. You can also spend loot in this step to purchase an upgraded Comrade Primary Attack card. You must have the upgraded structure shown and pay the loot. To wrap up, return all unpurchased NPCs to the city deck and regather all of your cards into the character deck. Now you can look through your entire character deck and choose the four heroes that you'll be taking to the next journey. If you've gained new character cards, these may not be the same as the ones you took into the previous quest. Additionally, each hero, including comrades, gets to choose one NPC to take into the next quest. This will usually be your upgraded ones because these are the only ones who have quest powers, shown in this lighter box here. These are generally passive effects which you apply at the start of the quest. You'll now complete full character setup for the quest in the same way that we saw at the start of the video. You may also end up with upgraded skill tokens which gives you access to your better skills, but there's no default way to do this. You'll have to discover how as you go along. You'll now proceed to the next journey phase. First is the adventure cards. You will have gathered several of them when the books gave them to you, and you can always freely read what's on the other side. This is purely thematic, what the card tells you. It gives you an idea of what you might find if you chase that part of the adventure, or what penalties you might suffer if you choose never to do that scenario. Once you've chosen, your next step is always to go to that lettered chapter in the journal. Start reading the story. This is going to take you on a multi-paragraph choose-your-own-adventure journey. Sometimes you'll have to choose a specific hero to resolve part of the story, perhaps to gain an item which will become useful in the quest, and it may involve doing a test, which involves taking one of the statistics that were used in the city phase from both your hero and NPC and adding it to a roll of the dice to determine success or failure. Often you'll be told to put cubes on different slots of the health track, and this is to keep track of the choices you've made. Here, for example, is a paragraph you read only if you've previously done something to put a cube on slot 7. There's plenty of story to read, and even puzzles to solve, which you'll track your progress in the campaign log, but eventually you'll get to the quest. If there's a lime green table, it will represent special rules for this quest. Red tables like these change the setup based on all of your previous choices. For example, cubes you've put in slots during the journal, or facts marked in your campaign log. A blue box also represents a rule which changes at some point during the scenario, and you can use the special ready team token from Arena the Contest to track which one is currently active. Finally, quest setup changes based on your Kemet Hunt level. At all levels above zero, each player must spend one special attack, discarding it from the quest before beginning. At levels 2, 3 or 4, you'll have extra enemies. Only place enemies that have stars matching or below your Kemet level. Finally, there are two chests in every quest, but if you're at Kemet level 5, do not place those chests. After each campaign week, you will resolve a world phase instead of a city phase. Use the world side of the board. For your first world phase, you'll place one Kemet cube into each region on the board, except for Warfugee. Take all of the quest cards that your team has, and then place them in the region which is stated at the top of the card. Now assemble the character deck in the same way that you do for a city phase, and each of the four players, once again, draws a hand of four cards. As in the city phase, each player will take one turn in any order. And you'll be spending cards again for those resources, trying to meet the requirements of the region. But unlike the city phase, you cannot play lightning bolt effects on other players' turns, and you cannot play actions. All these cards are strictly for their resources. The cost to remove a Kemet cube from a region is two force, that is two hammers. You can only attack the Kemet in a region adjacent to another region with no Kemet. 
Once that's been done, any other resources can be built together to meet this requirement in order to place cubes. Say for example, I played this character into West Seashores. It has four force, so the first two of those removes this cube, and it has enough diplomacy and influence to place one cube. As in the city phase, any excess resources that you play on your turn are lost. You're not allowed to combine resources with other players' cards. Each player gets one turn in this phase and will try to play as many of their cards as they can. There are two special options available. Any three resources can be cashed in to place one cube in Warfuge, and then any future player can spend one cube from Warfuge to add one ability to any other card play. Effectively, this is an earlier player cashing in excess resources at three to one for a later player's benefit. The other is that you can use a quest card if you play a character in the region containing that card. You'll resolve its world phase effect and then remove the card from the campaign. These cards generally combo very strongly with a character card of a certain type. Here, for example, it's bruises and tacticians. Here I would draw one card from the deck and then I would get to double any tactician and bruiser that I play on this region. That is, this card would be worth 10, 4, 2 and 6. Once all players have taken a turn, it's time to resolve the cubes that you've placed in the regions and war points sections of your campaign log. Note that it doesn't matter what colour of cube you place down, what matters is the colour of the next square in that region when you cross it off in the log. I have one cube in West Seashores, so I cross it off. From my log I can see this is my first one, so I return to the map and see that it's blue. A blue square gives me a strategist's war point. So I mark this off on the corresponding track without gaining any mastery. For a white square, gain the war point of your choice. Go through this region by region and read any new paragraphs from the city book that you unlock with these stars. The biggest benefits you'll gain from these are the campaign perks, powerful advantages which will stay with you through the game. In later game weeks, once you've crossed out all six boxes, you have conquered that region. From now on, you won't place a Kemet cube in that region during world phase setup. Instead, replace it with one of your hero minis. Also, since you no longer have a need for quest cards in that region, you can now use that quest card from any adjacent region. Once the world phase is done, you'll wrap up in the same way that you would the city phase and read the current week's world phase chapter in the city book. That's everything you need to know to get started on your campaign. There are a few more types of rules and these will be unlocked as you go along. Check these out in Appendix G when they come up. Also make sure you keep a good save pile of your character deck, your structures, any quests and adventure cards that you have and so on to make sure you carry the campaign from session to session. Some final things for you to know before you get started. Appendices C and D in the rulebook define all of the various effects and keywords that you'll find. Heroes with the commander combat role have special rules because they work with a companion and you can find those rules in Appendix A. If you don't want to play the full campaign, you can just play one-shot quests using the quest cards. Flip the card over and read what's shown on the one-shot quest mode. This gives you a little bit of thematic information about the quest and gives you special challenges that you'll target in this mode. Because of the way the game's information is split up between the quest guide and journal, you should be able to play these in a relatively spoiler-free way. But to adjust your starting heroes so that they're at roughly the strength they would have been in the campaign, refer to Appendix H and make these adjustments. You can use the heroes from Tanaris Adventures in the standalone player versus player or team versus team combat games from Arena the Contest. And instead of using the hero card, you'll use this Arena the Contest style hero pad to play the game. 
these aren't otherwise used in Tanara's adventures. The combat rules for that mode do vary, and if you want to learn them, you can check out our prior How to Play video for Arena the Contest, linked in the description below. Appendix E provides new rules to play that player versus player mode with automated AI characters involved. And the player versus player solo cards come with Tanaris Adventures. Appendix F explains the full cross compatibility of all previous Arena the Contest games. And finally, the rules are always evolving, so do check out Dragori Games' page for any errata in this rulebook. And that's how to play Tanaris Adventures. Thank you so much for watching. Everything you do will help us. Every single view, every time you like the video, let us know if you have any questions and comments, and see you in our next video.